Capri. Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Good Chalk Podcast. You got me, King of Crackdown, and you got Nikki Bass over here. And the title of this episode will be Down Goes in Ghana. So based off the title, you already know where we're going with this one. So Ngano got brutally knocked out in his last fight against Anthony Ju Anthony Joshua. So he got brutally knocked out by Anthony Joshua. It was no cutesy um, Floyd Mayweather versus uh, McGregor. You know, McGregor got stopped. It, you're dealing with heavyweights. It's not as pretty and cute when it goes wrong. Yes, I mean, McGregor, McGregor took a lot of damage. Yes, it was the same outcome as the TKO or not. But nah, it's, it's a difference. These are heavyweights, the biggest, heaviest hitters, the baddest man on the planet. When you get hit by them, clean. You see the ugly side of boxing and the ugly side of combat sports. Like this is not a pity pat. This is not a game. This is the fight business. And people get hurt and they get hurt brutally bad. Good thing Ngannou's in good health. Like he's not, at least not right now, showing no signs of any damage. Like he got knocked out. He said he didn't even feel it because that's like what happened when you get knocked all the way out cold. It was a case of accumulative damage. He got dropped what two times. He got dropped third time and put completely out cold. And he got dropped once in the, was once in the first round and twice in the second round, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it was a brutal loss. And just did not expect him to go out that way. I thought he would get finished in that one. I predicted like seven round TKO for him. Well, against him, not for him. I predicted him get stopped in the second in the seventh round. But I I thought it would be kind of like maybe a drop. Then maybe um um Joshua landing cumulative uh, cumulative punches against him while he kind of shelling up a little bit, or maybe the ref to see he's not re dealing well. He's kind of trying to block a little bit, and Joshua's on him. Maybe he even takes a knee, or he's he sat down against the ropes a little bit, but he's still conscious kind of thing. But I didn't expect him to get knocked over, knocked out, you know, just roll over his own knee. I didn't expect that. But but it's not, it's not really too much of a topic. Like, but where can we go with this one? But, um, yeah, like, I guess the thing is, like, Ngannou still made $30 million. It was, like, under six months. He fought Fury not too long ago. Arguably beat him and made $10 million. That was, like, that was the, um, and probably more than that. He probably made $10 million on top, guaranteed. You know, pay view might have made another ten million, maybe. I definitely think he made uh, more millions than this. That and definitely, he became even more famous, much more famous after that Fury fight. So in the Fury fight, that was like a great performance, the Fury fight, and that um, definitely raised his stocks a lot. And even though he lost on record, many fans and people in general, matter of fact, he lost on paper, but by all means, that was a win for him and a loss for Fury because Fury was the supposed to be the baddest man on the planet. And he let a guy who coming in debuting, who's not supposed to be known for being a technical striker, even in MMA, outbox you, basically. And fight you that close, drop you in a fight. So that was a win by any means. Like, because he was not supposed to win. In fact, that he arguably could have won or should have won that fight. That was when he walked away with 10 million, that big thing. But this one is definitely different. Yes, he made twice as much on, like, I guess, guaranteed for this one. He made 20 million versus 10 million in the last one. And then. A span of less than six months, he made thirty million guaranteed, and probably more on the side, and maybe some sponsorship deal. So we don't know how much he's truly made altogether, but he's definitely made at least thirty million, and guaranteed more than thirty million over that time. But what do you think about that? Do you think now after those two performances, do you think he made the right move in leaving the UFC, or do you still do you think now that it looks like a bad move? How do you feel? Man, it's so complicated because the reason that uh the Ingarnu left. The UFC is he wanted more money and and the fight with uh, Fury was like you said he could have arguably won that and I think you know a lot of people were going both ways with that and and I think it makes it tough because you, I didn't expect uh, Joshua to just come out like a lightning bolt and just strike you know multiple times in the same spot and 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 Ganu never been knocked out right. Has he knocked out or knocked down? down? Yeah, Maybe. never. So that was yeah, that's cold, man. I mean, I guess it's like I guess it would be like if if um Sean O'Malley fought not Ryan Garcia, but Gervonta Davis. Like if they fought, I think like just like uh Joshua, I think Gervonta Tank Davis is just such a natural. And Sean O'Malley was looking really sharp on, on on Saturday. I was very impressed with all the stuff he was putting out there. So for someone to do crossover and make it work, I think financially, Ngannou's killed it. He set himself up for life. If he 
you know, distributes that money correctly. I think he, he could live a very comfortable life and not ever have to fight again. I think he will fight again. I think uh, it just goes to show like Jake Paul, almost every one of uh, the people that have come over from the UFC to fight Jake Paul have gotten knocked down. Uh, some brutally, some, you know, it, it, they just got, you know, shocked a little bit, fell on their butt, got back up. I think uh, that was Anderson Silva who didn't, you know, get get really hurt too much. Like uh, Nate Diaz got got dropped pretty bad and uh, Ben Askren dropped, dropped pretty bad. Tyron Woodley got dropped pretty bad. So I don't know. I mean, it. the thing is, Nate Diaz just fought Leon Edwards, who's now the champion. And they went, what was it? Was it five? Five rounds? Yeah, five rounds. The second that he comes over and they put 12-ounce gloves on instead of eight-ounce or six-ounce, uh, he he gets dropped by Jake Paul. And Jake Paul's, like, he is a knockout artist, and you could tell that now, but, like, is it worth it for someone like Nganu, who, you know, was the scariest man on the planet by far? Like, I don't think there's anybody that, like, you put a cross from someone and they're not like, holy, I'm in for it. Like I, I better, I better buckle up. You know what I mean? So it for Joshua to knock out the scariest man on the planet. I think it just goes to show like people who are in boxing are a little bit sharper only because in the UFC, they have to worry about takedowns. They have to worry about all kinds of other things that it, the, it draws away from just being able to be a pure striker. And that's what you do. Like O'Malley does it and, and Israel Adesanya did it. But like, if you're not careful, like these guys don't have to worry about anything other than standing up and got, not getting hit. You know what I mean? Those two things. So I think it gives them a little bit of an advantage. I think, I think like you said, uh, Nganu isn't the most polished striker. He's just like, when he hits you, you just go down. It doesn't matter how big, how bad, how ugly. You know what I mean? And he fought. What do you think that uh, Joe Rogan said it? Do you think that Fury was out of shape for the fight with Ngannou? Yeah, I definitely think he was out of shape. But I don't think I wouldn't really even rate it so much or put so much behind the fact that he was out of shape. I think it's just a bad style looks to matchup. I feel, well, I, you know, in general, Fury is not like Fury is so rare that he gets dropped. He's been dropped before, been dropped multiple times. So. I still think even he came in a good shot, and Ghana would drop them. I don't think the I don't think um the striking total would be that close. I think Fury would have had more value, but I don't think Fury would have put away. Fury's not a knockout artist at, by any means, and he typically gets people away by using his size on him. And he didn't have really have size on Ngano. He definitely did not have the strength advantage on Ngano. It gets Wilder, you know, he probably had like 50, 60 pounds on Wilder, so he could lean on Wilder, drain him. But he can't do that with Ngano. So I think if he came in shape, he likely would not put away Ngano. Unless maybe 12 rounds, and then he really, you know, again, in a rematch. But he, even if he came in shape, it was an unknown factor. And also, um, Fury's just not really a knockout punch. He's a volume guy. He's a he's a technician. So, it, like, I think even the same thing, you put Uzik in there. Uzik not going to knock him out. I'll probably go decision. But um, Fury and they're going to go decision. But Joshua and Wilder, those guys that could potentially put, well, Joshua did put him out. And Wilder, that's the guy that put out big power. But, uh, like, Uzik and Fury, that's decision material. What do you think's next for Ngano? Ngano, I'm gonna ask you that actually. Do you think Ngano should continue boxing? And if he continues height, what do you think he should do? How do you think he should go about if he does continue boxing? So do you think he should continue, or do you think he should go to PFL and um just stick to super fights in PFL to maybe try to get that John Jones fight? So what do you feel he should do? Matter of fact, way I'm addressing this question, like should he just you no? Know, obviously he's gonna do both. Probably at least one more boxing matchup. He's definitely kind of somewhat contractually obligated to do at least one or two PFL fights. But I'm going to do a hypothetical in the case if he could only choose one, do you think he should stick to boxing? And how do you think he should just do that if he does stick to boxing? Or do you think he should go to PFL and just stick to two fights and try to somehow obtain a John Jones fight? If you're between the two, that was just the rest of the career, one or the other, which one will you choose he should do? And how should he go about either of those? Well, I mean, it, it, man, it with – Anthony Joshua knocking him out cold like that. It really just makes me, because I'm a fan of uh, Francis, it makes me want to say just stay with the, the the MMA. You got a big contract with the PFL. You could probably do really big things. You know what I mean? Uh, there's that 
PFL heavyweight who called him out and everything, uh, who, who's been looking really good his last few fights. I, I forget the guy's name. I know he's been in Herrera, I think. Brenner, Brennan. No, it's, yeah, it's Hinnon Herrera. Like, Hinnon, big heavyweight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, I think he should do that. Then I think it, maybe defend the belt once in the PFL. And then if he feels like boxing again, I think he should do hands down do what he loves if if he's falling in love with boxing and he wants to stick with that for a little bit do that but i think he should pick one or the other you know what i mean like for for the time being i don't think he should bounce back and forth and back and forth i think it's just it it, it spreads him too thin as far as like he's he's going to be training for wrestling and striking then he's going to just be training for striking then he's going to be training for wrestling and striking i i think it just I, I think it's going to take away from his greatness. And and I think Francis Ngannou is great, dude. I think he, like, he's up there with uh, Mike Tyson as far as I, I'm, I'm concerned. Like, as far as, like, scariness. Like, maybe not his career. Maybe not, you know, they, they did different things. But, like, as far as scary goes, I think Mike Tyson and Francis Ngannou are the scariest dude. So, hands down, do what he loves. I would rather see him fighting you know big fights in the pfl because i think that's where he can shine and he won't have to worry about you know what i mean training for something completely different you know a full fight rather than just boxing but what do you think what do you think should happen next um it, based on my question that i say if he had to choose one i would say choose him at this point he has got his two bo big boxing matchups i think box gonna be you know before he really can legit beat one of those guys and not take big damage because even he just try to take a little step down, a little step down, still a high level of boxing. Because what Deontay was, Wilder, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not even saying Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder one is still one of the somewhat three kings. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, and he had the most power of the three kings. So that that is a big concern. Even though Wilder looked very flat in his last fight, I'm talking about like Zeling Zhang, the guy who just um lost to Joseph Parker on the same card. Oh yeah. Um, he got big power. That'd be, he got he's an Olympic level um, boxer. I think he was like a bronze medalist. So he got skill. He got power. He might be forty or whatnot, but he still got power. He clearly was touching Parker. He got power and he knows how to use it. So it's, that's a dangerous matchup. And that might that was the guy who was looking for in Gano fight. And if Gano sticks around, that may be his next fight. Instead of getting Wilder, he might get a fight, and he probably get half the money and fight just as dangerous of a guy for him. So I think. Another route he could take in Boston would be basically fighting, trying to fight the lowest level of cans, probably, you know, how boxers start off fighting guys that are like five and 40, this and that, and just working on the fundamentals. And even then, that could be a, a gamble risk. You fight it for less money, you feel like it's going to be a rollover. But these guys still, even by those guys, have more and experience. Heavyweights are dangerous. If he yeah. if he sleeps on one of them at the wrong time. Yeah. Look what happened to, uh, was it Joshua who got knocked out by the Mexican dude, the big Mexican yeah. dude? Yeah. That's a guy a solid fighter, though, Andy Ruiz. He had good. No, no, he yeah. is. But every, what he was like, Plus six hundred. Yeah, it, it was just because was like minus yeah, five twenty five. Yeah, that was undefeated. Also, it's like and it was yeah. already world champion. It's not because um, his name was necessarily a bad fighter. He was already a solid fighter. It just and you know he's oh, already. Yeah, no, I have so much respect for Andy Ruiz. I just yeah. think like nobody expected yeah. that, and if you're not yeah. careful, look at what can happen. Yeah, sure. So um, I would say MMA because he already got the money money in boxing. I definitely think he could do both. But if I say he had to choose one or other, I would say MMA. And even right now, I would say take MMA right now. And I don't know if I would even say jump into take or Henry Fierro because Henry Fierro got a lot of power. Oh, and we don't know how yeah. to you know, get him out the belt. What else, what else would Francis do, though? He, I mean, that's like a super fight for PFL. Yeah. I feel like I, I would win him take a round, but he also could wrestle Henry Fierro. We saw they could do that to Cyril Ghan. And Henry Fierro's wrestling defense and jiu-jitsu is actually worse than um, – well, his wrestling, at least, is worse than – um. It's a real guy. He is very flat off the back. He's also very quick. A lot of times it be a you know a fight that's just good for one round and then just like flat. So maybe go that route. He'll probably bore the fans a little bit, but it might be what he needs to do because he can I, I think he's gonna be a little bit gun shy. He's gonna it's going he's not gonna be the same exact fighter after that knockout loss, at least not immediately after that. And yeah, and yeah, it made him take more. a year off and then fight MMA. I would say take a year off because you know, a year off. It could well, be what happened to Alexander Volkanovsky? He he came back too quickly against a very dangerous person. And I think anybody at the heavyweight level, if they're going to fight Francis and Gano, either has a big name or is a terrifying individual. You know what I yeah. mean? That's so I want to say, you know, I feel like Volkanovsky got knocked out and he came back like. 
two like what like two months later three months later yeah something crazy like that like but something I, like four I think, or four months i think something close yeah. to that. i think Engano come back you know it's still what, like march so i think he come back in like october november so it gives him enough time to come back and was, also yeah, I agree with probably that. With Marco, God damn it, he could wrestle up Henry Fiera and drop some ground pound and probably finish him on the ground or knock him out late instead of trying to go for it toe to toe. But um, yeah, I would say MMA, and I definitely think he could do both. And the final thing about Ngannou, the whole Ngannou thing is um, I guess they Dana White, the Dana White side of thing, the UFC like kind of hard to beat the man because they don't actually have to get in the ring to fight. They just kind of throw money around, but. But you guys, you said you, you think um he won. And I would say I think he won. Like MA fans and um UFC, what I you may fans, like UFC like loyalists, like loyal UFC super fanboys, like too invested in like they're making money by hey, the UFC or Dana White feeling like he got over on fighters, but I don't feel so even if you say oh he would got twenty minutes for John Jones, that would have been just for one fight. They would have gave him a twenty even he said already, like if he would have got a John Jones fight, it was like a one off fight. And I think they say if he it was like oh if you win you make this much you don't win this that much but with these fights these were guaranteed so he can say oh speculate if he would have won this speculatively if he would have stayed there he would have beat John Jones and this and that but there's no guarantee he you fight in one of the best heavyweights of all time and Joshua in boxing but you literally fighting the best MMA fight of all time in John Jones and MMA so it's no guarantee he would have won that John Jones has never officially lost well really lost a fight you can say he technically lost there um, Dominic Reyes. But it was a score for him. You could say he officially lost to Matt Hamill, but he obviously was dogging Matt Hamill. So, but yeah, that would have been tough to sell out of the way. But this with the box would be it's a guarantee that he's made thirty million in like, like six months or less. So I think he won, and I still think he just it's not like his MMA career is over. It's also not like the, the level of strikers in MMA are boxing level. And I think again, I think if he takes a year off, he could still come back fresh and make the right adjustments. Especially if he takes slow. He's, he's still got all this talent and skill, and he's still only going to get better, in my opinion. Especially in MMA, still got a lot of room for growth. Even though he's like with thirty-seven, hey, wait, it's a different ball game. And it's not like his his natural power is still there. It's like what about Ngannou has changed? It's not like he's one of the guys that rely on speed and that you know speed and being like super fast and bouncing and all stuff. Like he got big power. He could he puts it on your chin and you out. So. With his game plan, it's nothing diminished. Like Volkanovski, he got to be a brain. He got to be this and that. Dealing with much faster guys. You start getting slow at 45, it's all your career's over. And that's a different ball game for Elliot Tepore. I mean, not Elliot Tepore, um, Volkanovski, but for Ngano, he don't have the same issues. Right. And I think he can follow. But um, yeah, now on to the next topic. UFC 299, what was your, I guess, biggest fight or biggest, I'm going to say biggest fight or biggest fighter? Um, moment like what fighter had you fought the biggest moment? Or what do you feel? Which fight was stood out most to you from you? Like so, which performance or which fight or performance in fight stood out most to you for from UFC two ninety nine and why? Man, uh, Robles that 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 dude a minute in knocks him out. I I mean, Curtis Blades to to be dominated like that, and then and then to come back and just. Hammer fist, the dude was like insane. I I think like from that fight on, I was just like glued to the TV. Like I always love watching it. I I I always pay attention, but some fights will be slow, and I'll kind of jump on my phone for a second. You know what I mean? While they're on the floor, just sitting in missionary position. But like from Curtis Blades on, man, I I was I was extremely impressed. Uh, Peter Yawn. I, I thought Song Yadong was gonna win. I thought I, I bet a little bit of money on Song because he was plus money. Um, uh, but uh Peter Yawn impressed me. Um that was a hard fight. I I I believe he got hurt early. Um that's what is you know the rumor that he uh he hurt his leg in like the first round. And you know, to to still come on like that, man, much respect. Um Gilbert Burns, that fight was crazy, bro. I had Gilbert. I had Gilbert and uh, Dustin Poirier in a in a uh, parlay, and Gilbert almost pulled it off. I also bet on Jack Dallamanalena though, so I, I guess I kind of you know played both sides. But I I thought if Jack is able to hit him at least once, and and I think the first round was crazy. Like, didn't he get a knee off on him? And Burns was just stumbling. I don't think he stumbled. I, I didn't get when he it was no stumble. Obviously, the third round that was that was the stumble, but I don't oh, want yeah, it, it yeah. feel like 
it was like kind of kind of like was that a downward knee or was that not a downward knee? But Burns ate it pretty well. But the yeah, first one, uh, the third one was perfect time though. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, Gilbert Burns, he impressed me. I, 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 I kind of thought, who's Jack Della Maddalena? Like Gilbert Burns fought Hamza Chimaev for fifteen rounds. Like, there's no way this random Australian dude with a crooked nose is going to come in here and dominate Gilbert Burns. I'm like, it just ain't happening. But I bet both sides because I, I was like, man, I don't want to spread myself too thin. But uh, I was extremely impressed. Michael Venna Page killed it, man. He, he came out and proved why he belongs in the UFC. And I, I know Holland can be a hit or miss, but like Venom Page was plus money and he's 22 and two, you know what I mean? Or 23 and two. Um, Dustin Poirier, I guess uh, Ben Waugh had been on antibiotics all week and, and that's why his gas tanks, I, I saw, I bet on Dustin Poirier in the, before the second round started, because I was like, I was like, bro, if, if Dustin can get him to the third or fourth round, I think I don't think he's going to be able to last. And he turned around and caught him with a beautiful hook. Man, it was it was lit. And then Sean O'Malley put on a masterclass. Like I I love Martin che Marlon Cheeto very. I think he's the man. I met him. He's super nice. Like took the time to talk to me. Um, so it was it was sad in that aspect. But man, Sean O'Malley just looked so on point. Like uh, Tim, his coach Tim calls him says it's like Jordan and like I was like bro that's a little early for for Jordan talk I'm like but the way he just like outpaced Cheeto for five rounds was just insane and like that knee that Cheeto took man it was just crazy uh the last thing I will say though Jack calling out Shavkot crazy Shavkot's like bro you'll end up like the last guy so if that fight happens I would be happy I'm I'm super Super high on Jack now that I saw him fight someone as skilled as Gilbert Burns, but uh, uh I I think he he's gonna go far and if he keeps working hard, he's really polished striker. So what did you think? Uh, you said everything. I said one. Well, you said everything. So you already took everything out. So we good on that. But um, I guess I'll mention two things since you mentioned everything. You said um O'Malley. He's talking about Jordan. It was co saying he's like Jordan. It feels like Jordan. But also with this thing like. All this early hype. I mean, he's already accomplished a lot. He could retire and you know, probably end up in the Hall of Fame automatically. Might take a little bit longer, but he already has a low key a Hall, Hall of Fame career. It may not at the point now just yet where everybody gonna start to at some point th th three title defense gonna be. You gonna need at least three title defense to be a Hall of Famer. We're not there yet, but I know it's coming soon because a lot of people getting bills, a lot of people getting defenses. So it could be my fault. Three defenses was so much, but pretty soon that's gonna be like. Yes, when the belt is very important, it's great. It still puts you in like the very well, one less than one percent of the MMA. But you really try to be one of the greats, like the true greats. You try and climb up that goat list, like really be on that goat list, certified. Three defenses, probably like that's going to be a initial qualifier to be even in that talks of goat. You know, not even just goat, but like to be even like a uh, mention or even hinted at or even uh, given a dot to be someone of a goat. Or I mean, at least three, three title defenses, at least three title defenses, plus some other stuff. But. I got, I do got a question though. One thing I left out: Sean O'Malley's calling out of Ilya Taporia. Now it yeah, makes you already, you, what <laughs> <laughs> you already saying everything I'm about to say. But um, <laughs> yeah. So again, uh, he's so early in his, his title defense. He only got one defense now, and he, he just won the belt like end of last year, and he just had one defense now. And he's already talking about super fights, and he's like, Ilya is trying to tell me who to fight next. But I got more defense. You got one defense. He got no defense. But y'all both fresh champions. He talking about none of y'all could call shot shit. Y'all both freshly champions, and he's trying to say he wants the Ilya fight. Ilya say fight, ball, I mean fight. Um, his his boy Marab, but neither of them have are any positions of calling in. So I feel yes, Sean should fight Marab next. He should put up like at least three defenses for Tonsu fights. And Ilya beat Volkanovski in or fight some other guy. You know, you get like two, three title defenses before y'all even talk about going up or going down or this and stuff. But he called talking about Makachev and Sean O'Malley talking about Ilya. They both trying to get that champ, champ, but. How do you feel? You feel like it's too early? You feel like they should just stop all this talks of trying to jump and fight super fights before you even defend your belt? Yeah, I mean, you kind of, you made a point, uh, I think it was either last video or the video before. Uh, it was it was after the Ilya fight. You're like, man, these dudes need to wait. Give them a year or two. You know what I mean? At least, like, Islam needs to defend the belt, you know, at least once or twice. And then... Uh, Sean O'Malley and Ilya need to be champs for at least two years to have, you know, 
at least two or three defenses minimum. And I think at, playing it fair and playing it, keep it not holding the division hostage. I think that that's a fair assessment. Although I would love, like I said, Sean O'Malley would get knocked out by Ilya Taporia just because of like how, how nasty Ilya is with them hands. But like, I think Sean O'Malley might have a, you know, little skin in the game, the way he looked on Saturday. Cause I mean, he's probably only going to look better the next time he fights. So I think for me as a fan, I would love to see it. Like I would love to see it, but uh, as far as what makes the most sense, I think, I think you're right. I think they have to do at least two or three title defenses. All right. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, um, was the one, one thing, um, so yeah, that already could recover some, that one and that was so I guess to the final segment of it. Good chalk. We're gonna jump to UFC Vegas eighty eight. It's a couple interesting lines on there, a couple ones. So I'm start off with the main event. So do you feel um what's his name? Ty do you feel Ty Tui Vasa is good chalk or bad chalk? He's like minus one twenty five, minus one thirty five right now. Do you feel like that's good chalk for him or bad chalk? I, I think man, Ty Tui Vasa is dangerous. Like He's been dangerous for the past few years and he's been fighting straight killers. And like, I I think he's a well-seasoned veteran at this point, as far as like fighting some really top level talent and winning and losing. Um, so I think it's good chalk. I think uh, Tybora can be dangerous. And I think if, if he's able to get in the flow, I think that Ty might get a little frustrated so I, I could see I could see how it could move the other way just a little bit, but um I love it. I love Tai Tui Voss. I think it's good chalk. And uh even if he was fighting someone else, I I I, I always lean to him as far as like if there's good odds on first or second, third round knockout, you know what I mean? That I, I usually will play a little bit with. So I think it's always good when Tai Tui Voss is in the building. What do you think? I think it's bad chalk, especially money line. I feel, I guess, you kind of see the angle. So it could be a 50-50 fight, and and it's also kind of easy to gauge how a fight would go if he does win. Like, he's not submitted him. He's not a decision, especially in the five round. It's only knockout. It's likely in the first two rounds. And I think Taiki Basa has not won a fight beyond two rounds. He has. And so he had knocked you out in the first or second, or he loses decisions, or he gets ground and pound and TKO'd or knocked out. And also in his last fight, three fights, he's been dropped in all three of his last fights. He got brutally, I think the Rogan fight set up his down his downtrend. Yes, he dropped Cyril Gaon in that fight, but Cyril Gaon, that was probably the most damage he took in his whole career in that Cyril Gaon fight. It was, that was a brutal knockout. It was a cumulative damage. Dropped here, dropped in. You know, he like he was looked like he got hurt so bad, like he was wobbling on feet like a baby that learned how to walk. And he got hit with some ground and pound. Knees was shaking while he was on the ground, hit with ground and pound. Like, it was just a lot of unnecessary damage in that one. The Pav Pavlovich fight, that was like, you know, he got dropped and he got dropped again, but it was not nearly as much cumulative damage as the Cyril Gaon fight. But still... Right back to back, brutal knockout. He returned real quick after getting brutalized by Surreal Gone to get knocked out real quick by Padovich and like with the first round and got dropped twice in a couple seconds and then um put out or a little under a minute and got put out like that. And then he fought um Volkov got put a lot of damage on him, got dropped in the first round, then he got submitted in the second round. So he got took a lot of damage. And Tybor is an underrated fighter and Pavlovich, not Pavlovich, but um Ty Tuvas doesn't seem to be improving upon his takedown defenses wrestling at all. And Tybor could definitely implement that game plan against him, take him down, and let the ground about him. He beat um, Spivak, who was able to do the same to him. He, he did what Spivak did to him, basically. He did that prior to Spivak doing that to him. So I think if Spivak could take him down, that he's, I think Tybor can. But I guess, like, if you could get um, maybe plus 200, I think that's, that's I would say that's okay chalk. I would say good chalk for um, Tybor. Um, yeah, not the board, two of us. That would be good for two of us. That would, I would say that would be good chalk, 200, because then, like, you could double your money. And you kind of play a little bit better, but kind of like around pick them. I don't like too much, but I guess it's easy to hedge because it's, it's like it's like in pick them odds. You know, you put in a parlay, you like them come out positive. I'll have to do much too much to it because not like he's minus three hundred. But to me personally, I don't like to chalk for him on him unless it was like around. Not that's not even chalk. It's plus, <laughs> but I don't like him as a favorite. But I do say if I were to bet him, I would like him at plus money, probably around plus 200 range, you no, know, in a prop maybe, but is a favorite now. So I would say bad chalk for Tattoo Boss. No, so, yeah, what? I agree, actually. It's bad chalk as far as like, I think it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty 
even match. I think it's a pick em. I think it's kind of like the Jelton Almeida uh, and the Curtis Blades situation. Like, I think something can happen either way. So I think it would be better if it was like, if they were both like minus 100 and then the prop, like you said, the prop. So I, I, I love tie two glass though. So that's why I, I said good chalk. But as far as no, I, I can agree with that. All right. Now, another one is, let me see, who's, who's else on this card? Who's else? Jack Jaku? Yeah, that's it. You, you, so you're reading me, my mind ahead of my time this morning. Like you read, <laughs> you read notes. <laughs> You're like, I know this is how he's going to go. But um, yeah, yeah so Kenny Chuku, minus 500, good chalk or bad chalk, going in there with uh, Senior Citizen OSP. Does I he mean, still got some left? Yeah, I, I think it's just, I I think uh, last week was a perfect, um, was a perfect example that like veterans are still dangerous. You know, RDA stuck in there with 15 minutes with Gamrot, and Gamrot's just like a machine. He's like, he's like the, um, uh, Polish version of Marab. So I, I think uh, if you're not careful, like uh, Dustin Poirier did, and uh, there was one more, per Gilbert Burns almost won. You know what I mean? I think you have to be very careful with, with betting on, on against uh, people who have the experience. I mean, you're right. He is a senior citizen with almost 40, yeah, over 40 fights. So he, he's definitely... He's definitely uh, up there, but I think he, he could still be dangerous if Kennedy and Kennedy takes it slow and he kind of picks on the outside, comes in, you know, he 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 does a lot of different things. So he he's just got to make sure that he doesn't let Ovin St. Pru get in a flow. And uh, I think he could win. But I think as far as the betting goes, I think it's bad chalk. But I do think Kennedy and Zetsch who wins 100 percent. I would say the lines aren't. Great, like you know, just thinking from like a like a stat wise, but I would say it's good chart to be honest. I think you know with other guys you mentioned, like um Pore, Pore's not nearly as old, and Pore obviously still in the top five. You know, he's still fighting, you know, just about the best he just fought. Like he's definitely better than his WEC days, he's definitely better than his 45 days. I would say he's better than his early 55 days at UFC. He might be at his best as far as you know, when he was fighting Dan Hooker and some of these other guys, or you know, some other of these streets. Or maybe when he was going to the Khabib fight, or right after the Khabib fight, when he was beating on um, some other these some of these other guys. But I still say this is one of the better versions of Poirier. He's still not a shot fighter, so I think Poirier still oh, very yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, right. they, like they might not be at their very best. Maybe that's debatable, but they still are very much hungry and alive. OSP clearly his last go fight to show that he's not there. And stylistically, why I don't feel like he never really was the perfect stylist to match up for in Chuku. So I just feel like all of them kind of lean to it. Like I feel like you don't got the cardio or durability. He probably went up trying to wrestle. And I feel like Inzak Chuku should win. And I also feel like you can get better odds with him in the distance. And I don't think he's going to go to city. I definitely think this don't go the distance at this point in his career. So I think you could lower that value with a prop on like in the distance. He might potentially submit him, but I think more than likely it's going to be a KO. But you probably get a, still get a decent value at this Kennedy Inzak Chuku in the distance. Might be get that at minus 300, maybe minus 200 something. But I think it gives you a lot of options. And I think this is why he should win. It is a concern that he's coming himself come off a knockout loss, but that was to a world class striker and the guy that's you know can that will pressure you versus um, OSP that's li li typically a guy that finishes you by you know catching you coming towards him like you over aggression and Enzo Chuk was not an over aggressive fighter, but yeah, not the greatest value. I mean, value is not there at all. But no, I think I'll probably that bet him in. I'll probably put him in a couple of my parlays though, just because I I'm I'm so like I believe he will win. But yeah, I, I'm on the fence as far as minus 425. There's no real value, but I, I like the props you put out there. Yeah, I think he's, a, as far as like a money line, yeah, that's not the best. Like, I would, unless you got deep pocket, super deep pocket, yeah, the money line, that would be bad. Charles. But as far as the way I'm thinking about it is like a parlay anchor type play. I think that's why I mentioned like good job. I mean, as far as this functionality, because it might be minus 500, but the chance of them winning or the, the, how they're going to win is that's be the question mark. I would say, yeah, that's, that's not good job. But as far as my is again, the, the line's not being good. They be minus one thousand bucks. They oh they they're going there for sure, lock like for sure lock or whatever case may be, and that could make them a great parlay piece type of thing. That's why I would say he kind of his chalk is good in the parlay piece. He's a, again a great anchor. And then the final one I'll mention is um, Josie Ann Nunes versus um, Chelsea Chandler. I think right now um, Josie Ann Nunes is still the favorite. I think she's like minus one twenty five. Do you think that's good chalk or bad chalk? 
Um, minus what was it? Like minus one twenty five, minus one thirty five. I think Chelsea Chandler. I think she's just she doesn't have as much experience as Jose. So I like I I, I like that. But um, I think I think it's hard to tell, man. I I I would say good chalk as far as like her record and and what and and like her stats and all that stuff but i think you know what i mean i we, i need to see her fight more who was the last person she fought i forget who it was uh, um she fought norma dumont dumont's like a future well, no, she's right on the cusp of a title shot at both 45 and 35 so i think 45 is getting removed so i can see um norma dumont potentially fighting for a belt by the end of this year okay so yeah then i think i think it's good chalk i i, I don't see why why uh she should lose. Chelsea has two losses on her record. Uh, Nunez only has one. So I think I think it's good chalk. I think it's better than the Kennedy and Jechiku money line chalk. I will say that. What do you think? Um, I say it's bad chalk right now. Jose and Nunez, even though she hasn't lost yet, she has not necessarily looked super stellar. She had one stellar performance, but she knocked out B Malachi. But outside that, I don't feel like she has had a stellar performance. She just took um, Zara Farn to like a two finale decision. And then prior to that, she got taken down by like a fighter who was like a hair and gone type fighter who was like not really good anywhere where they get easy take down on her. And Chelsea Chandler does have some underrated wrestling, even though she hasn't really shown it too much in the UFC. I think she should be able to use it being like 5'8 versus like a 5'2. Josie Ann Nunes is like very understaffed for the weight class. It is really just a brawler. No real skill, just brawling. I think Chelsea Chandler, you know, at least shown durability, showed a strong chin and I guess heart, and she'll stick in there. I think she'll be able to make an ugly fight and get some ground to pound and get some control and probably edge a fight, but. It's definitely not one of the fights we can say it's super like, oh, it's just still like this flat out bad chalk, good chalk. It's a low key a pick and fight. So right. it's not bad chalk, but I would say bad chalk just to pick one or the other because right. I'm picking Chelsea Chandler. But at that pick em odds, you can't really say that. You would kind of do that. Oh, watch he's minus 300. Then that's definitely bad. Like clearly, obviously bad chalk or minus four and five or whatever. Or, uh, versus, you know, uh, that big odds versus in a fight between a pick em. But my, low minus 100 is not really bad chalk, but I will say it's bad chalk because I'm picking Chelsea Chandler. And obviously, because, um, What's the name? Jose Nunes is undersized, but yeah, I would say bad chalk, and I think Chelsea Chandler could likely make an ugly fight, get takedowns, and because Nunes doesn't have the greatest takedown defense. But yeah, that's pretty much all the odds, and we're gonna wrap this video up. Anything else you got to say for you know any odds stick out or anything anyone else leave the people with? Man, uh, the only thing I want to say is thank everybody for watching. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, if you guys have any ideas about stuff, throw it in the chat. We'd love to hear it. Um, but, yeah, I, I just want to thank you as well. All right. You're welcome. And thanks for being on the show. And thanks for being a partner in this Good Chalk podcast. And that's the video. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. And come back for more videos. Peace.